I want to thank everybody for joining us to our second lecture in Arizona State Museum's Border Barriers History and Impact Talk Series. We're glad so many ASM members are and others from all across um, the place. I know somebody from Alaska is here. Last time we had people from Canada, even somebody from India. So I know you're all here from different time zones and different geographies. And thank you for joining us here in the Sonoran Desert um, with the Arizona State Museum and Todd Miller. I'm Lisa Falk. I'm head of community engagement at the Arizona State Museum and I'll serve as your host today. Um, as some of you know, many of you I assume, um, the Arizona State Museum is part of the University of Arizona. We're located in Tucson on the ancestral land of the Tonatum and Pascoyaki. The museum's collections and research focuses on the indigenous peoples of the Southwest and Northwest Mexico. And we present programs exploring the history and cultures of the region. Because of COVID-19, unfortunately, the museum is currently closed to the public, as many museums across the country still are. Just before we closed, we opened a traveling exhibit called A History of Walls, The Borders We Build. And you can read the script and see some of the images from that exhibit on our website. I hope you will check it out, it's interesting. The exhibit focuses on four border walls, the Berlin Wall, which was the subject of our lecture last week, the US-Mexico Wall, which is the subject of many of our lectures, and the Palestinian-Israeli barrier offense, which will be the subject of a future lecture, and the Great Wall of China. This series of talks is offered in conjunction with the exhibit with support from the Arizona Humanities. Speakers present various perspectives on the history and current reality of the various border barriers. They will address questions raised by the exhibit, such as what were and what are these walls meant to be or to do? Uh, what did they mean in the beginning? And what do we understand them to mean now? How have people interacted with these walls and how do these barriers affect people? the environment and cultural practices, as well as tribal, tribal sovereignty and cooperation among nations. This afternoon, the second talk in the series is presented by Todd Miller. Mr. Miller has researched and written about border issues for more than 15 years. His work appears in the New York Times, Tom, 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 Tom Dispatch, The Nation, San Francisco Chronicle, In These Times, Guernica, and Al Jazeera English. Mr. Miller authored three books, Emperor Borders, The Expansion of the U.S. Border Around the Wall, Storming the Wall, Climate Change, Migration and Homeland Security, and Border Patrol Nation, Net Dispatches from the Front Lines of Homeland Security. You'll find his presentation fascinating, I'm sure, I know. Um, after Mr. Miller's presentation, he will answer questions you have put in the Q&A box. Answer as many questions as we have time for at the end. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Todd Miller to share his talk, Massive Fortification of the U.S. Border, A Modern History. Good, good afternoon, really. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Lisa and Darlene from the Arizona State Museum. It's really a, a pleasure to be here and really um, honored to be a part of the speaking series. Uh, and so thank you and thanks to everyone for, um, for joining uh, this conversation. Can you put on the first slide, please? If you were going, if you were, if you were to go to Nogales, Arizona, this is what you would see. And um, I'm just giving. Well, one of the reasons I want to just look at this right now is to pose the question: How did we get here? How did we arrive to this place? And I also want to make the point that this wall, in many manifestations, has been here for the last 25 years. And so um, the most recent. Uh, part manifestation that you'll see on the wall is the coiling razor wire, which has been put up by the Trump administration. So I'm going to go over that history as best as I can within the limited time that we have today. Um, if you could turn to the next slide. The, the, the next slide, uh, this is another um, uh, uh, version of the border wall, and that's actually in the imperial um, it's near San Diego or San Isidro in California. And you can see that it's going out into the ocean. And I'm just showing you different manifestations of it for, for those who haven't seen the border wall before. Um, that's my four-year-old. And one of the reasons why I wanted to have him in the photo is that he's about to have a, an epiphany, which I'll share with you later in the, in, the, um, in the talk. Next slide, please. Now this, this um, slide is, 
at Oregon Pipe National Monument. And this is what's currently happening. You could, what you're seeing are panels of, of a 30 foot border wall that is being um, put up as we speak. And people might have heard some about this this particular um, swath of territory and and this cons this border wall construction, there's been uh, documentation of the saguaro, the saguaro cactus that have been bulldozed in order to build the wall. There's also been a lot of um, focus on Quito Baquitos Spring, which is a sacred spring for the Tonawatam people, and um, and there has been a, a lot of protest of this border in this particular place. Um, including uh, two weeks ago to uh, land defenders, indigenous autumn land defenders, um, blockaded uh, bulldozers, some of the bulldozers, and were um, are then arrested and detained um, and spent the night in, in Florence in prison. So there's, that just goes to show that there's a lot of resistance over this border wall. And one, another reason why I wanted to show this particular one is because perhaps uh, this is the same place uh, more than 170 years ago when a Tona Autumn elder um, came, acro came across a surveying team, uh, kind of a group of soldiers and others who are surveying what would be the US-Mexico border for the first time. And it was cut. It was going to cut through Tana Atom territory, and uh, and this was right after the signing of the Gadsden Purchase, right after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and then the Gadsden Purchase, and and it's it was when the, what was determined to be the border was that we have now the contemporary U.S. Mexico border was set in place, and the survey and the and the Autumn Elder came up to the. Um, the group and said, what are you doing? Why are you surveying here? And he went on to explain, our land goes hundreds of miles to the south. And he was pointing pretty much, you know, to Hermosillo in Mexico. That's as far as the Tonatum territory went. Or when it goes hundreds of miles to the north to Phoenix, to hundreds of miles in every direction. Um, and so what, what on earth are you doing here, um, uh, making this line through our land? And um, and so that was the beginning of, of what would end up with uh, what is happening at this very moment where people are, are um, challenging this, the, the border wall construction. Um, I, but for our purposes today, I, I would, um, would rather concentrate, while there is a huge history um, to the border, I want to focus on the last 25 years. And, and the last 25 years, while it's many years from when that when the autumn elder approached the surveyors drawing the first borderline in Arizona. Um, it is well, it, it, it predates the Trump administration uh, uh, claim that they are the first to build a wall by a long shot. And so, um, so that's what I would like to look at this these past 25 years, because if you look at the past 25 years, we're going to see a period of, of, of the most massive fortification of the US border that we've ever seen in US history. And that includes walls and technologies and border patrol agents. And I'm, and I'm going to um, talk about it now. And so best, it's best to begin maybe in to go back to 1993. In 1993, if you go to El Paso, you go back, go to the El Paso sector, and um, the the new sector chief was a uh, was a man named Silvestre Reyes, and he he um, he uh, would actually eventually become a de Democratic congressperson. It, some of you might might know, but at the time he said, "I know another way." And there's a long story behind this, and I, I do encourage people to look into this story. There's some good books about it as well. One's called Blockading the Border by Timothy Dunn, who's a sociologist. Um, but Silvestre Reyes said in 1993, I know how to stop people from coming across the border. What we have to do is, is uh, concentrate our agents side by side by side by side, right on the borderline between El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. And that's exactly what he did on a day of September of 1993. They put agent, agent, practically next to each other. They stood side by side by side and stopped all people from coming across from Ciudad Juarez. And this was deemed Operation Blockade. There was the agents and then the, there were um, helicopters that were flying overhead. And basically they did really cease 
any traffic across the border. So much that in Ciudad, on the bridge across from Ciudad Juarez, there was a protest, a massive protest three days into this. And, um, and so at the same time, in 1993, um, Doris Meisner, and she, she was the commissioner of the Immigration and Naturalization Service. She stood before the US Congress and said, and I will quote, um, responding to the likely short to medium term impacts of NAFTA um, uh, will require strengthening our, the strengthening of our enforcement efforts along the border. So, so basically, uh, Meisner was foreseeing what uh, the, the massive migration that was about to come from Mexico, a lot due to the impact of NAFTA, at least 2 million small farmers, for example, were impacted in the first couple of years after the passage of NAFTA and, um, and were displaced and many of them came north to the United States. And so when, um, actually, could you, could you switch the slide, please? So this next slide, it actually um, shows, uh, you can look at the, at the terminology, it says border wall system. And that's, that's a term I'm gonna come back to. This border wall system, as it says, um, uh, at these numbers below actually are from the Trump administration. There are 300, so the Trump administration claims that they made three, 321 miles of border wall system progress with um, this amount of steel, tons of steel, and this amount of tons of concrete. And so uh, the, the um, so my point is the border wall system actually long predated that moment with the Trump administration. I would, I would look back to um, the beginnings of t today's modern border wall system to, to that Operation Blockade in 1993, and also the, the onset of the strategy that we see on the border, which is called prevention through deterrence. And that would, um, prevention through deterrence, um, what would be explained, and that's a strategy that's still currently on the border, but it would be explained in a 1994 strategic memo from the Border Patrol. And the whole idea of prevention through deterrence was much like what Reyes was doing in El Paso. The idea was to concentrate uh, agents concent and build up walls and reinforce by technology in areas where people traditionally cross the border such as El Paso, such as Nogales. Um, and then that would, the, the idea would be that the deterrent would be that people will be forced to circumvent those areas and go into desolate places, much like the Arizona desert. Um, and that would be a deterrent. And, and the memo even said, even a, the deterrent would be, it would be a mortal threat. And so that's what prevent, prevention through deterrence. And so, so we have a number of operations that come out of that. So you have um, Operation Blockade, which was from, from Reyes and El Paso sector. They changed the name because Mexico actually um, protested the name Blockade. So they changed the name to Hold the Line, Operation Hold the Line. And then a number of other operations uh, happened um, after that. One is Operation Gatekeeper, which people probably are aware of, in Southern California. So the whole idea, again, of blockading the traditional crossing places in San Isidro, uh, building up a wall and technologies. Then Arizona, the, the, the operation in Arizona was called Operation Safeguard. And how did that play out? Well, um, so so when you think about Arizona pre-1994 and post-1994, and this is when Operation Gate or uh, Safeguard was implemented, pre-1994, um, well, I, I would actually uh, um, suggest a, a great book by Yeva Jusanite, Jus, Jus, Jus who um, writes about, it's a book called Threshold, and, and she writes about um, the, uh, the intrinsic connection between what people call ambos nogales which is the which is nogal how nogales arizona and nogales sonora are basically the same overall community in many ways and one of the ways is that you know the the independence day parades used to crisscross across the border without being stopped at all or firefighters used to be able to cooperate more 
um, to fight fires and different, you know, across the border or come together. They still could do that somewhat, but it was it was a lot more in previous years. Uh, and or uh, like a friend of mine, a good friend of mine who grew up in Nogales, Sonora, um, pre nineteen ninety four. He used to he used to he he has all kinds of stories about crossing the border through what was a chain link fence. And there was a hole in the chain link fence and he would cross the border to pay bills at the, at the department store. He would cross the border to, to play basketball uh, with his friends. Of course, the US Border Patrol existed and sometimes he got caught by the US Border Patrol, but it was much easier to cross. He said one of the, the, one of the main things he had to worry about was a kid at the hole who would charge a peso to, for, for them to cross through. And then in 1994, all this machinery came in and that ended. The machinery plucked out the, the chain link fence and it, it, it built up a 15 foot wall with uh, landing mats. Landing mats, military landing mats that were used in the Persian Gulf War, Wars and the Vietnam Wars. Um, and uh, the, um, the, so if you look in this, and this happened months after the implementation of, of Nogales or of NAFTA in Nogales. So um, while clearly um, things are happening before this, right? And, and again, the U.S. Border Patrol was, was formed in 1924. There was other fence building and wall building um, uh, operations that happened over, the, over the, this, the 20th century. But this was basically where we have that modern history and its beginning and really the acceleration of the um, massive uh, expansion of the border apparatus. Um, could you do the next slide, please? So this next slide actually kind of shows in terms of budgets, um, how, this, how this growth has happened. And if you go back to 1994, and I know that it has 1990, but in 1994, the budget for the INS 1.5 billion was 1.5 billion dollars, and that would include INS, of course, was the Border and Immigration Enforcement. So that we could say the Border and Immigration Enforcement budget was 1.5 billion dollars. Um, and if you follow it, actually, it this this particular graphic has it till 2018 to 23.7 billion dollars that's annual budget so these are yearly budgets but that's actually more for 2020 2020 we are now over 25 billion dollars for the annual budget so that just goes to show you the 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 massive growth in terms of just budgets and and those that budget of 25 billion dollars in 2020 that's kind mining customs and border protection and immigration and customs enforcement so if you put those two together that's the budget and by 2012 it, it's worth mentioning the budgets for CBP and ICE combined were already more than all other federal law enforcement agencies combined including the FBI U.S. Marshals you know, you name it, all of them combined, they were already exceeded by the border enforcement, border and immigration enforcement budget. Um, next slide, please. This next slide is going to show like how this, this has translated. You can see the border patrol has grown uh, significantly. Uh, if you look at 1994, and that's when those operations that I meant, just mentioned began, the, the number of Border Patrol agents was 4,000. So again, Border Patrol began in 1924. So for 70 years, it, it grew slow, it grew, but slowly but steadily. And then you can see going up through those oper first operations, it, it actually doubled up up into about 10,000 by the end of the Clinton administration. And then if you look at the post 9-11, uh, and when I say post 9-11, um, I mean also the creation of the Department of Homeland Security and, and the increase, if you notice on the previous slide as well, how there's an, a drastic increase of, of budget with the Department of Homeland Security, the implementation of that. Um, you can see also with the Border Patrol, a jump a significant jump of agents. There was the largest hiring surge in the history of the Border Patrol that happened between 2006 and 2009, for example. So that's that's another uh, another example. You could turn it to the next slide. Um, this next slide actually is. I really apologize. It's it's way too much text. This 
if you want uh, copies of these graphics, you can, you can look for it. It's actually in a report called More Than a Wall. More Than a Wall, just Google my name, More Than a Wall with a Transnational Institute. It has all of this. And this I, I can see now is too text heavy, but it really goes over the different phases from pretty much uh, from the 1994 period that I was talking about and all the different operations. And you can see the different budgets, how the budgets increased, for example. The Clinton administration, it went from a $1.5 billion budget to annual budget to $5 billion uh, annual budget during uh, that administration. And then George W. Bush administration, well, it started at 4.2 billion, but then it went up to 14.3 billion by the end of his administration. And that's the creation of DHS. So you can see all of that and the different technologies that were being implemented as well. If you could do the next slide, please. And, and if anybody wants a copy of that, please, please, I can, I can try to get people copies of, of this information. Um, this and and during this time also, and it's worth worth mentioning this this uh, this graphic actually shows what the actual border jurisdiction is, and it's a hundred mile zone. So if you notice from the from the U, two thousand mile U.S. Mexico border, it goes up a hundred miles, and it has those sorts of jurisdictions. The purple splotches are populations, and the, so the border jurisdiction goes. For down the 5,000 mile US Canada border as well and along the coast. So when you have this expansion of, of budgets of border patrol agents of um, you know of, of you know technologies, it all kind of expands into these into this jurisdiction. So that's why I wanted to show this particular slide and I can talk about more the 100 mile zone a little bit more in in the Q&A but it's also what the ACLU at first called it the uh, constitution free zone they've since they've since uh, said they don't want to call it that because it implies that your constitutional rights aren't you know, it, it, you don't have them in these in this zone, and you actually do. So maybe we could call it a constitution mangled, mangled zone. And that the the main thing is that your the, the your right to not to be searched nor seized, the Fourth Amendment, is mangled. And and in these areas, it's uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security can set up immigration checkpoints. Um, and, and among other things. People who are familiar with what happened in Portland, Oregon, as far as BORTAC, which is a Border Patrol tactical unit, that they were technically in a 100 mile zone. So technically Border Patrol can operate in places like Portland. But that's, that's, um, that's getting tangential. Um, so um, when you, there's a couple of, uh, um, when I, when you think of the, so there's there's a couple of different phases that I would think has, in this modern history. One is the the first, the Clinton administration, with the Operation Gatekeepers and Safeguards, and then the second phase is the is the um, is the uh, post 9/11 and the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. And with DHS and in terms of the border wall, there are two particular things points that I would. I would like to focus on. And that's another reason why I think this graphic is good. Because there's one, one, there's 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 two things that came out in 2006. One is called the Secure Fence Act of 2006. Um, and the other is what's called SBI Net. And SBI Net was um, the SBI stands for the Secure Border Initiative. And uh, so SBI Net was the technological, what would, they, what would you call the virtual wall? Um, that went hand in hand with this increased uh, uh, construction of border wall. And the reason why I want to put those two together, because we ha it, 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 it's almost imperative in the modern era of the border enforcement to think of what is called the smart wall, right? Or the, the virtual wall or the smart wall. The fact that the, the wall is one thing, but it's, it's backed by a whole technological apparatus. So when you look at 2006 in terms of the border wall, actual physical wall itself, uh, that um, the Secure Fence Act actually created 650 miles of walls and barriers. And, that, and, and this included in Nogales, if you were to go to Nogales and, um, and see the, uh, the, the landing mat wall that I described that went up in 1994, that was actually taken off in 2011 and replaced 
with what is called bollard style wall, which is basically see-through, um, see-through in the sense it's like bars, like prison bars almost, that Border Patrol agents actually requested that they could then see through the wall into Mexico. Um, and so that, that, that bollard style wall was, was put into Nogales. And, um, and so there's a, the Secure Fence Act. So you have now 700 miles, um, nearly 700 miles of walls and barriers, all again to remind going in the prevention through deterrence uh, strategy. So concentrating in urban areas where people would cross, walling off those areas and making people circumvent those areas. SBI net um, was the technological. So there was cameras put on the actual walls themselves, but there's also uh, cameras and, and surveillance systems that were another what they would call layer of border. And that's, and that's what SBI net was. In fact, the virtual wall, as they called it, was first the first company that was contracted to, to create the virtual wall was Boeing Corporation. Um, the Boeing Corporation uh, got a contract nearly, was, that would be worth nearly $2 billion in 2006 to create this, this virtual wall. And I, sh and I should mention that, because a lot of my research um, over the years uh, on borders has been um, looking at the privatization, has been looking at the corporate, uh, different corporations and businesses that have been involved in border building. And, um, and when you, in, in 2006, with the, the increase of budgets, the, D, the creation of DHS, CBP, ICE, and this kind of, this focus on, on building up the border, um, there's all kinds of companies that started jumping into this, into uh, get into this contract uh, pool, uh, increasing pool of money. And in fact, I have a stat that even astounded me um, that, uh, that um, I just recently came, came across. And it's, it's between 2000, if you, if you look at the, between 2006 and 2018, uh, between Customs and Border Protection, CBP, and ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, there were 99,000 contracts given out, worth $45.2 billion. And the, if you take that number of $45.2 billion, it's a total number, accumulated number of border and immigration enforcement budgets, if you, if you tally them from 1975 to 2002. So that, that should give you a sense of how, first, how much privatization has gone into this, this the border building, but also how drastically, um, how drastically the budgets have increased um, since, you, you know, the 70s, the 80s, and even the 90s. Um, and, uh, and so also like this, these sorts of, uh, there's lots of market forecasts that are out um, around um, uh, these uh, different companies that I should mention that one of one of the things that I've done over the years and actually you can go to the next slide one of the things that I've done is go to many of, of what are called conventions or border security expos or um, different places all around the world where uh, border like vendors from different businesses will will meet up with with agencies like Department of Homeland Security to sell their um, different technologies and that sort of thing. The, the slide here is actually in Paris, France, where I was, and that's a predator for people who are familiar with the science fiction character, but behind the predator, you can see that people are talking about different whatever technology. And this was at a millipole as a Homeland Security Convention. So there's different countries from all over the world going to talk with vendors. Um, and, and this was a good example of what what uh what it was like i can't this picture doesn't do it justice but when you were in the 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 convention hall you just saw from you could see it was endless and all along the on the floors there were robots uh crawling around and there were um all kinds of biometrics and facial recognition and drone systems and license plate reading systems and even border even border walls themselves being displayed like quickly deployable border walls high tech camera systems that sort of thing and that's and all that stuff is exactly um what what you know the united states 
in what it was intending with SBI net and the deployment of the virtual wall with Boeing Corporation. Uh, however, what happened was a Boeing corporate, the, the, the contract with Boeing got canceled because the virtual wall system that they were putting up didn't quite meet the standards. But, but, but what happened was that, that then the contract got dispersed among a number, a number of different other companies. And that's where we're at right now. If you, so right now, um, if you just have to go to, from where I am in Tucson, for example, just down the road, down the interstate 19, maybe 40 miles to come to one of the first uh, towers, which is a high tech surveillance tower that was that was put up as a part of the virtual wall. It's located near Nogales, about 10 miles uh, north of the border. Um, the Elbit, the the um, Boeing, it, it's not by Boeing. Another another company, Elbit Systems of America, which is a subsidiary subsidiary of Elbit Systems, which is an Israeli company, got the contract to um, build what are called integrated fixed towers or surveillance towers uh, across Arizona, nearly 50 of them. And so right now that, that project is completing, actually the last bit of it is being done on the Tan Atom Nation. There was resistance on the Tan Atom Nation, which again borders Mexico to having these towers, but they agreed to have 10 towers put on the nation, the legislative council. Um, and, so, and so that, that uh, um, so that's the kind of virtual wall system that we have. You have the integrated fixed towers, and just to explain what that means, they're called integrated fixed towers because they, they correspond with each other. So, so they're not isolated towers. Each tower is in ta works in tangent with the other towers. And then all of their feeds, and now they have these high-tech surveillance cameras that can see 7.5 miles away. They have night vision cameras. They have ground sweeping radar. One border patrol agent told me that the ground sweeping radar um, uh, could, uh, with its radius, was what had the ability of 100 border patrol agents. That's that's how much that's a high estimation this agent had in this in this technology, and so they all work together and they and they feed into command and control center along the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, I've, been, I've been able to look into them, and they're basically Border Patrol agents, but right now, actually, National Guard soldiers are in these monitoring centers, and they look at what these integrated fixed towers, and they're generally away from the border, are showing them in the monitoring center. They're also looking at the, the cameras that are on the border wall, so they have all kinds of, you can see the border wall, and if a motion sensor, and there's thousands of, uh, of implanted motion sensors along the U.S.-Mexico border. If somebody steps on a motion sensor, it'll beep um, in, the, in these control centers, command and control centers. So it's, what they're doing is this kind of technological or smart border or virtual wall all together um, and uh, into, uh, into what is called, what I would call, as, as I said earlier, the border wall system. Um, could you... Could you go to the next slide? This next slide shows, it's just this, 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 this slide shows one of the scope trucks. It's just the, one of the examples of, of um, this, these kind of technologies. And, and I, I should mention that colleagues of mine um, have written a paper looking at these technologies, specifically the integrated fixed towers, and um, showing how they are um, a part of the prevention through deterrence strategy, how it does, that people are circumventing the even the technologies like the border wall, like the border, how the border patrol agents are concentrated into what is what are desolate areas of the border. Can you switch the sl slide, please? And this next this next map actually shows um, what that's a, that's Air Southern Arizona, and those red dots um, are remains that have been found of people of border crossers. Um, uh, that many have attributed directly to this prevention through deterrence strategy, how people get funneled away and go into more desolate areas where it's, it's impossible to carry enough water, to carry enough food. Um, often dehydration is, is um, a cause of death. And, and, this, and there have been up to this date, at least 8,000 remains that have been found. Most, most people think that that estimate is low 
there might be as many as three times more or even higher numbers. There's lots of families that, are, that continue to search for lost loved ones. And, and that's one of the, the big impacts that we particularly see in Southern Arizona to this kind of enforcement, building up of the enforcement apparatus under a strategy that, that has people funneling into different places. Um, could you change the slide? I'm gonna try to speed up as I, as I can continue. This is the epiphany of my four-year-old um, that, uh, that I mentioned at the very beginning. And the epif this is the precise moment. And what he was saying was he was offering, why do, because you can see the border wall behind them. And you can see on the other side in Tijuana, there's actually people out on the beach and lots of like umbrellas and people enjoying the beach. And he was wondering why, why do we even have to have this to begin with? And he, he came up in his, in his case, he's like, why don't we turn the border wall into bikes? You know, why don't we take the material uh, from the border wall into, and turn it into bikes? And I, and I use that as a, as a kind of segue into the last part I just want to mention. And, um, the last, the, I want to finish up my conversation and then we can have, we can have um, a question and answer. Um, and uh, the, I want to finish up my conversation with uh, talking about, I, I wrote this book called Storming the Wall and it looks in, and it published in 2017 and it looks at climate change and the effects on displacement and borders. And one of the things I did with that is that I went to the actual US-Mexico border a little east of Agua Prieta, Douglas, for people who aren't familiar with the geography, and went to a place called the San Bernardino Ranch. And there, um, they're doing a water harvesting project. And if you could turn to the next slide, please. Um, and the, watering, the water harvesting project, um, well, the, I, I put up this, this picture on the slide because the first thing that, uh, um, that my guides at, at, at this binational organization, it was a binational project for the water harvesting called Cuenca Los Ojos. And they took, but they first wanted to take me to show me where the border wall or the border barrier had been dragged into Mexico. So what you're seeing before you with this slide, in 2014, Hurricane Odeal um, hit really hard in southern Arizona, remnants of Hurricane Odile. And then it the washes filled up and the and they slammed, you know, they they came rivers rushed into the US Mexico border and it literally smashed the border wall in some places. In this case a part of the border barrier. And it dragged it uh, literally a quarter mile in inland into Mexico. So that was the first thing they wanted to show me. And and I wanted to show this picture because if you look at it and it, you can see that it is being devoured by Mother Earth. You can see that there's like, it's being taken by, over by plant life and, and uh, spider webs and actual purple flowers that are, that are, um, that are like growing out of it. And actually it's, it's, uh, a year later I went back and it was even more covered with, um, you could barely even see it. So if left alone, without any maintenance, the, the border apparatus actually would be devoured by the planet. But um, at that point, I looked, I was a quarter mile away from the border at a place called Silver Creek. And I looked and they, I saw they had reconstructed the, um, the border barrier. Behind the border barrier about, uh, well, directly behind the border barrier was actually a US Border Patrol agent with a green striped vehicle. It seemed, I couldn't tell, but it seemed like he might be looking at us or wondering what we were doing. And then about a quarter mile behind the, the border patrol vehicle was a uh, integrated fixed tower, the IFT that I just explained or just talked about. So it was a, an example of the border wall system, right, of technology. And um, but but uh, if you could switch the slide, they sh the project the project um that they wanted to show me was not that it just happened to be right on the border. What they wanted to show me was what they were doing in Silver Creek, which was building gabions and. And that picture is a gabion. And what struck me about the gabion, it's, it really looks like a wall in a way, or a, a stone wall, an intricately carved stone wall in many ways. So I started to think, wow, this is a tale of two walls, right? There's this wall and the other wall. And the, but this wall, the gabion wall, was meant to be like, they're like sponges. So when it rained and the water came through the washes, it would slow down the water. The, the earth would then drink, the, the soil would then drink the, the water, the slow down water instead of erosion. And then the plant life, that um, different plant life and, 
and animals would come back to the area. And exactly that's what was going on. So my guys at Cuenca Los Ojos were pointing out, look, the desert will willows are growing. Look, look, uh, the, um, you know, you know, the plant life is coming back. The native grasses are coming back. And they, and then they said something amazing because there's been a 15 year drought in Arizona. And as people in Arizona know that some of the most impactful uh, um, impact, the biggest impacts of climate change are going to be heat and drought. Um, and this area was definitely suffering from a drought, but they, what happened with this water harvesting project, it was that the water table rose 20 feet. And I said, what, that's a miracle. And they looked at me and they said, that's not a miracle. They said, uh, they said, we just, we just pile up rocks, right? And then another amazing thing was that the water, not only it crossed the border, right, the, to the wildlife refuge across the border. And so the water table rose there and it rose in a, in a town that was suffering from people who are migrating uh, about five miles to the south in a hilo. And um, in a place that had been seeing dwindling, more scarce water, and all of a sudden they're getting water back. It's not a save all. There's still a lot of, there's still just like the creek is running three months instead of two months, that sort of thing. But it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a reversal in a way of, of, um, of you know what had been happening. And so, and so, uh, so the point here is, is that, wow, you know, there's, there's, um. There's options we have before us. Like uh, when I when I talked to one of the founders of Cuenca Los Ojos, I asked, "What could you do with twenty billion dollars?" Because that was the year the year I was doing the interview was 2016, and the border immigration budget was twenty billion. And she just started to gush. Right? She started talking. I didn't even have my recorder on. She started talking about places so far away. I didn't, I'd never even heard of them. Um, you know the, the the kind of impact. And she said, "This could be the difference between life and death for people." And, and so I want to end this with one last thing. Right here in this very area in San Bernardino is exactly where, as I started with Quito Paquito um, and how the water resources are being dwindled to make, to make concrete for the border wall there. The, in this San Bernardino, there's border walls being constructed there as well. And water resources are actually dwindling. And so this is actually a hot spot for the border wall um, as we speak as well. And so I just wanted to leave the, leave the discussion with, you know, there are many, there's many things that we can do. There's many, the, as we think of like what humanity needs for its, its well-being, perhaps there are many different things we can think of and many different alternatives that we, could, we can think of together. Um, and I'll, I'll leave that for any sort of conversation that we'll have now. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you so much, Todd. I have, uh, Three pages, no, four pages worth of questions written down. Right. So we'll just start on them and see where we get. Um, a quick one is what is a landing mat and what is its purpose? A uh, landing mat is um, used, I believe, for helicopter landings in the military. So the landing mats that were used on the border were, um, they were used in military scenarios. I believe it's for helicopter landings. Um, so they would land on them. It might be airplanes too, but I, I think it's helicopter landings. But it's a, it, but they're they're like big panel, big metal panels. So when you, so they rid the the first kind of border wall like that in Nogales, for example, if um, that that switched in 2011, were these land panels of landing mats kind of stuck together? They almost it looked like a rusty, it was like a rusty wall that would snake up and down through the hills of Nogales. Um, but that it was definitely, it definitely came from the military. It's using military surplus uh, to um, build the border apparatus. Okay. Um, do you know any reason why new border patrol strategies, even today, seem to be tested in El Paso? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I guess the strategy, yeah, El Paso is a big place where border patrol strategies are tested. It's actually where BORTAC, um, that, the tactical unit that I mentioned, the tactical unit of the Border Patrol, um, kind of like the special forces of the Border Patrol, that's where their headquarters are in El Paso. El Paso was one of the first uh, Border Patrol stations. Uh, I think, it, amazingly, it was El Paso and Detroit were the two first Border Patrol stations in the 1920s. So El Paso has been 
I mean, there's Fort Bliss there as well. El Paso has been um, one of the uh, places, um, you know, it's a, it's one that, you know, it's a kind of a core center place of, of Border Patrol activity in a lot of ways. I remember one time I was traveling to El Paso and I saw strikers, uh, like uh, this kind of joint task force between uh, the the, arm, uh, the military and they were using armored cars with this highly sophisticated uh, surveillance technology alongside border patrol agents. So this kind of, uh, and they were, they were surveilling the border. It was in New, southern New Mexico when I was heading over to El Paso. And that was one of those, I, I would say that's one of those proving or those tests that you mentioned. Um, I went and say also that Arizona is a huge, huge, huge testing place. The, and the virtual wall, the integrated fixed towers, it's the first place for those, that sort of thing. And the virtual wall and these kind of increases of technologies. Um, so Arizona, especially when, it, when you were, we were seeing high volumes of people crossing the border, um, became like a hot spot, but also like one of those places that were, where all kinds of technologies are being tested. And a lot of that's turned to southern, also southern Texas and the Rio Grande Valley area, where where there's been a, a shift of of people crossing. More and more people are crossing through that area. So you can see technologies such as aerostats, which are surveillance balloons, uh, shifting over there. Um, Todd, sort of related to that technology, one person asked, "Has there been any thought to using border wall technology within the United States?" I think. A lot of, in a lot of ways, the border is a proving ground and uh, technologies that are used at the border are then used often within the United States. Again, the, one of the, the clear example that comes to mind is the board, it's, I know BORTAC is not a technology, it's this unit, but the fact that they're, they're, there's, there's people protesting in Portland and they're used in those protests, that's an example of a kind of migration of the border into other places. And, and you can see, like, I, I remember, you know, talking to different people, like people that are, are um, like in the business angle, the business side of technology, and they would always stress, you know, yeah, you start this on the border, you develop a technology, you develop a camera system, but then that cam camera system can be used for perimeter surveillance for a building here or an airport or a federal building or, you know, so this kind of, uh, that a lot of times the border becomes a proving ground and then the technology will be proved, right? And then it'll move on to other areas. And that, that happens quite a bit. Yeah. Okay, another question is, if the border wasn't created until the 1920s, what was the status in immigration enforcement before that? Well, the Border Patrol was created in 1924. Um, before that, there were, there, I mean, a lot, in a lot of ways, the border was very porous and people could cross rather freely. And that, and that would go on even after the Border Patrol was, was formed. But also where there was enforcement too, um, like the Texas Rangers, for example, or the Arizona Rangers um, and military would sometimes do border enforcement. And there's some pretty, um, pretty uh, brutal um, stories from those early years in the 20th century, the, the late 19th century. But also it's, it's um, really imperative to say that one of the first um, laws of, of excluding a nationality was the, was the Chinese Exclusion Acts of the late 19th century. I believe it was 1884. And so often the border was, um, uh, was used in that. In fact, you know, I, you know, many Border Patrol agents, when they talk about the, the formation of the Border Patrol in 1924, they'll, add, they'll say, hey, do you know why we, 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 um, we started? And, and then nobody will know. And they'll say, because of the Chinese laborers, the Chinese that were building, building the, the Southern Pacific Railroad. And so, so that, the idea that, uh, um, so there's these, these Chinese exclusion acts on the, and, and then there is, you know, a different, a number of different immigration laws that were passed in the 1910s and then the 19, in the 1920s that really started to expand who, you know, who to exclude and who to include. But, but one thing, even though that all that was happening, one thing to, to say was that the militarization of the border that we see today is relatively new. The massive and fortification of it is very new. 
And that's why I wanted to focus on those last 25 years, because even though there was border, the border and enforcement, there was a lot more free crossing um, going on before before even 25 years ago, even like how we mentioned Nogales, how people, the parades would go back and forth. Um, so that's, I, I, I like to keep that in mind just to say, well, this is new. Like this, this, this massive kind of fortification is new. That means that it doesn't necessarily have to be here. Okay, so then I have a couple questions dealing with our northern border and wondering if there's been any kind of wall or barricades built there or any talk about building anything on the northern part of our country. Every once in a while, somebody will mention it. I forget who the last politician who did. Maybe it was Rand Paul. I can't remember who did. But uh, there, but there is no wall or on the on the U.S. Canada border. But there is increased enforcement, and uh, the um, there is increased technologies. Like if you go to Niagara, if you go to where I, I grew up in Niagara Falls, actually, and right around the, along the Niagara River, you can see like the surveillance towers, much like the surveillance tower towers you see in Southern Arizona or Detroit, around Detroit, you see this. There's a couple drones that fly, fly out of uh, South, uh, North Dakota, a uh, state border patrol station in North Dakota. And the whole 100 mile zone um, uh, element that I was mentioning before, that, that is what you see more than anything else. It's not like, it's more what I've seen in my research and investigations on the, and what I've seen in other people's research on the, on the Northern border is that the 100 mile zone and that means means patrolling east west flow of traffic rather than coming across the border that means border patrol agents in greyhound bus stations that means border patrol agents in um, amtrak stations that means border patrol agents along patrolling along um, freeways and that sort of thing um, has targeted people of um, uh, undocumented people often people of color um, in fact they actually tallied skin complexion in a couple of the reports and it's almost exclusively people of color and in a way that you can see that the northern border enforcement is almost like interior enforcement of undocumented people that are already here that are working jobs in the north that are picking like going to harvest season in apple orchards in new york state for example that sort of thing that's the main thing that um my research and the research of other people that i've that i've read um have have concluded well, that's good because the next question was going to be about that. There's been a couple questions about that 100 mile zone and noting that um, major cities in the US fall within that. Somebody asked what percentage of the US population lives within the 100 mile zone? Two thirds, two thirds of the US population, 200 million people, like 66%, right? So amazing. It's, a, it's amazing how much population <laughs> lives, in that, lives in that jurisdiction. and. Uh, and one would think, well, it's mainly concentrated on the southern border, and you're right. And then, and but as we were just discussing with the northern border, like there's stations with those budget increases, with increases of border patrol agents, there's stations that it, that's that formed after that after nine that after nine eleven that weren't there before, like Erie, Pennsylvania, or Rochester, New York, and and. And so as these budgets grow, as it expands, it expands more and more into these 100 mile zones. And you can look, you can look at the state of Maine, for example. No one would think of the state of Maine. The state of Maine is 100% within the 100 mile zone. The state of Florida, 100% in, in the 100 mile zone. And the, the state of Florida has now, I believe, seven border patrol stations. And they do a lot of enforcement off the coast. So there, you're seeing more and more enforcement happening off the coast. Uh, directly off the coast as well. And so, yeah, so that's, um, and again, as the, the, the idea of the Fourth Amendment is challenged, right? The, the, this, this not being searched nor seized, um, those sorts of rights um, are what's being contested right now in the 100 mile zones. Okay, so somebody mentioned the San Antonio Express News reported in August that of the 266 miles of walls built by the Trump administration, quote unquote, only five miles were in locations where the borders, where the barriers previously existed, the rest were built as, or rebuilt or replacement walls. Is this correct? I think that's incorrect. Um, I think that, uh, that uh, a lot of the walls um, were built 
Well, it's a replacement in the sense there was a lot of wall that's been built um, where there were, was vehicle barrier. So you go from vehicle barrier, which is basically like the Normandy barrier in that, in that um, image of the barrier that was being devoured by the planet. That was a, that's a Normandy vehicle barrier. And that, that um, and there's many areas that Trump, the Trump administration is building where they're removing that, those sorts of vehicle barriers and then building like a 30 foot wall. And, um, and that, there, that I'm sure like at the same time, I'm sure the Trump administration is trying to say that it's built more as much wall as it possibly can, which may might mean just pure out just replacement. But to say that replacing a vehicle barrier with a 30 foot wall is just a replacement, I don't think it's correct. And I and a reason why I think that's incorrect is I saw that misreported quite a bit. Um, uh, I've seen that misreported quite a bit. Okay. Um, all our are all the walls actually on the border or is there a buffer of U.S. land between the border and the wall on the Mexican side? Texas. If you look at Texas, it's really interesting. The, and on, in Arizona, you'll, you'll see the border wall right along pretty much. It's in the United States, maybe by six feet. So you can look go to Nogales and look at and see the actual border monument on the other side of the border wall. Um, but in Texas, there's so many there's there's all kinds of private land ownership and that sort of thing that the wall itself is is um is there's swaths of the wall that, that are built behind where people are living in neighborhoods in the in the united states so the wall happens after the neighborhoods the wall actually is in like goes into this like crooked fashion um compared to arizona and um california and um, that's actually what's in debate right now in Texas, like this eminent domain, like can DHS take over people's private land to, to build the border wall? And there's a lot, of, a lot of resistance in Texas right now about that, that happening. And there's a lot of, you know, a lot of people that live right along the border who are stuck in between that, that have a lot to say about these border walls being built. So, um why the increase of border security budgets, how effective has it been? And have the numbers of people crossing decreased because of it? Well, um, so you look at the prevention through deterrence right from the beginning, 1994 strategy, and you have really massive increases of people, even as those, those strategies are being implemented. That's when the walls, the first walls are being built in the cities and the increase of border patrol agents and the technologies and people were starting to circumvent those areas. And that's in the late 1990s, that's when you started seeing people really dying um, crossing the border. Uh, and so, um, so you have that, those sorts of increases and this really, really increasing cro crossings going all the way up into the mid 2000s into like 2005, 2006. And then corresponding with the Great Recession, right? The, the 2007, 2008, you see this like drop off of people crossing. And, and 2008 also happens to be when, when you have a lot of resources going into the border. So you, you have like at that time border, you know, the CBP is saying, well, our increased enforcement is what's stopping people, right? It's stopping people. Well, it's, it's, you know what's happening is people are being funneled, right? That's what it happens. that's what that's what it's shown to do. It does stop people from crossing through cities, but it funnel they funnel around. But at the same time, there's other people like economists saying, "Well, people stopped coming because the jobs started drying up, and there was no jobs." And so there's that tension between, uh, um, uh, like what you know, this increased border enforcement and this lack this lack of this, this these lack of jobs, and that and and I imagine there's like. Indeed, like as the border develops, as the apparatus gets bigger and bigger, as more walls, more technologies, more agents, by 2012, there's 21,000 agents. As that all increases, it does become more and more difficult to cross. And so you see routes going deeper and deeper and deeper and further desolate places. You see more and more people crossing through through mountain ranges and that sort of thing. And it does, and it, but people are still crossing, but it just becomes more and more difficult to cross. So it is true. And that's, it is true that it, it is more difficult to cross. At the same time, you know, there's the economic reasons and at the same, and at the same time, the deportations of people really started to increase in those 2000s and into the 2010s. And that meant 
that there's a new dynamic where the people coming back to the United States trying to reunite with their families who they've been deport deported from. And so there's that. So there's all kinds of dynamics at, at hand, but I'm sure there's kind of a mixture of a number of different things. Yeah. I'm going to try to get in a few more questions because I had a whole bunch, but um, yeah, <laughs> have you identified any structural challenges with the current iteration of the new wall construction and has any of the new wall been breached? Uh, like the new, the new wall, like the one in Oregon pipe, you know, the, your, the, this wall is um, being built in places where not many people, I mean, there's, there people are crossing, but not in very small numbers. And um, and so it, what happens if you look at the wall building building Oregon Pipe? Now people are going to further to the West Desert, like to the Camino del Diablo, the De Devil's Highway, right? The the West West Desert, the hottest hottest part of the Arizona desert, and that's where you're seeing a lot of deaths now, right? And um, but it's actually in a place where where you know in a way these the where the walls are being constructed san bernardino ranch right where that how i ended there's a wall being constructed there but the the pe like people it seems like they're it, in, as opposed to like the original prevention of the deterrence where people are crossing through cities and now it's blockading now the wall is almost seems to me that it's it's one like it was funny, I did a ride along with a border patrol agent who was showing the bar, the, the razor wire, and they showed, they were showing how, the, how it was getting cut, like outside of Nogales on the outskirts. It's like people are, are definitely crossing. And I'm sure it, it, people show that they can cross the wall. They can climb a wall and get across it. It's it, even a border patrol agent themselves, have, border, border patrol agents have told me that they consider it to be a speed bump. I, I mean, it doesn't quote unquote work in there. And, and their definition of it working, unless there's agents behind it to enforce it, or some sort of, sort of technological thing behind it to enforce it. So in my estimations, and this is me just speculating really, I don't know this for sure, but it's almost like the wall is, the wall is as it right now, it's like going through sacred autumn territory. I'm sure Ned Norris will be talking about this next week and desecrating like sacred sites like Quito Baquito Springs. And at the same time, it almost seems like it's part of a of a campaign, right? It's part of a like like the Trump administration has said we're going to build this wall, and come hell or high water, this is what's happening. And it seems like it's an increasing this year. So right in a campaign year, I don't know, you know how I'm speculating, but I I, I see it almost as as almost like this is my, my campaign promise, and I'm here, I am building it. And as far as what it does, what it, the effect that it has, if any, is to drive people further out. Well, I'll ask you one more question that kind of is a follow up to that. Um, somebody said you mentioned 8,000 deaths. They wanted to know since what year and if that was only in the Arizona area or along the entire southern border. It's along the entire southern border. I believe that's since 1998. So looking at it since 1998, um, 8,000 remains that have been found should be stressed. So many, uh, there's many, there are estimates that, um, I think uh, Jason De Leon, who's, who wrote the book, The Land of Open Graves, which is a really good book around, around the prevention through deterrence strategy, um, I believe, and I, I don't wanna misquote him, but I think he might've said there might be as much as three to 10 times as, mu as many um, but remains to be found. And you can kind of determine that by how many families are continue to, to search for their lost loved ones who are contacting different organizations like um, Colibri, for example, is an organization that's helping families search, you know, search possibly for loved ones who forensically really that might have died while crossing the border. So the estimates are, are much higher, but this, that 8,000 is the remains found along the entire 2,000 miles of the U.S.-Mexico border. Okay, thank you. And I want to mention that along with the border exhibit, we have a film that um, I created with a couple of other colleagues um, at the Center for Latin American Studies, uh, which is a quick history of U.S. immigration policy and it's on, you can look on our YouTube pro, um, channel. I think it's called um, U.S. Immigration Linking Past to Present. It's like a 15 minute overview and it mentions about the Chinese and, and it gives some personal stories in there that fit our immigration laws, but it starts back in colonial times and goes to 2016. 
So um, if you're not familiar with our immigration laws, that's a quick way to get an overview. Um, I want to thank you so much, Todd, for this very informative and timely talk. Um, I know there's still other questions I didn't get to, but it's, it's already almost, it's 511. So, so again, thank you very much, Todd. Thank you for everybody else who hung in till the end and, and um, we appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.